what happened. But then as I started looking at it a little bit more, I wasn't happy with a few things, and so I had to make some changes. So Sylvia, I apologize for um, making more work for you guys. Not a problem. So, all right. <laughs> that said, let's get right into the introduction. In Lesson 215, we began looking at the marginalia in the 1611 that marked some sort of textual variant within the source text used by the King James translators. Recall that we have observed two different functions for the double vertical lines as noted by Samuel Ward at the Synod of Dorton 1618. First, okay, where a Hebrew or Greek word admits <clears throat> two meanings of a suitable kind, the one is expressed in the text, the other in the margin, i.e. These, these are alternative English readings. Okay, that's what they are. And second, to be done where a different reading was found in good copies. Now that's important because Ward is telling you that another thing they did was note places where another reading was found in good copies, right? Now we think through what we saw last week and we see that those, that is explicitly used in different formats uh, about 20 different times. So the number of the next point, the number of the marginal notes of this second category, so that would be the second category there where a different reading is found in good copies. <clears throat> the number of marginal notes of the second category is very small compared with the number of alternative English renderings demarcated by the double vertical lines. When a textual variant is being cataloged in the margin, the note usually takes one of the following five forms. Sometimes, as we saw, it's some read, nine occurrences. Some copies, four occurrences. Some copies read, four occurrences. Let's just stop there, okay? Now, does that match, does that match this point right here from what Samuel Ward said at the sign out of Dort? He said, to be done where a different reading is found in what? Good copies. What are they doing? They're literally saying some read, some copies, some copies read. Are they expressing there exactly what Ward stated, what's, what, uh, what Samuel Ward stated at the sign out of Dort, okay? So there are nine occurrences of some read, four occurrences of some copies, four occurrences of some copies read, two occurrences of Greek copies, and one many ancient copies, okay? And I've given you the references there. And we'll be looking at these in a little bit more detail. So remember, this is still a little bit of review. So of the thousands of marginal notes found in the 1611, only 20 indicate the presence of textual variants in the source text used by the King James translators. So there's only 20 that are explicitly marked in this fashion with one of those five forms. Some read, some copy, some copies read, Greek copies, ancient copies, right? Uh, please see Lesson 215 for a description of the process used to arrive at these findings, as well as photographic evidence of each note and discussion of possible sources for each variant. So that's what we did last time. I'm not going to repeat all that. If you want that information, you need to go look back at Lesson 215, or if you're watching this, click on the link, and it'll take you back to that lesson. So in this lesson, we want to provide an analysis of the material covered in Lesson 215. Therefore, the current lesson is best viewed as part two of a two-part treatise, okay? So let's get into the analysis. Before beginning our analysis, I need to note awareness of F.H.A. Scrivener's 1884 work titled The Authorized Edition of the English Bible 1611. Section two of Scrivener's book is titled Its Marginal Notes and Original Texts. In this, uh, in this section, beginning on page 58, Scrivener states, quote, the following, marginal notes, the following marginal notes to various readings occur in the New Testament in the two issues of 1611. They are nearly all derived from Beza's text or notes, um, end quote. Okay? So in this section, the one beginning on page 58 in, my, in the copy I have, in this section, Scrivener catalogs more marginalia dealing with, quote, various readings in the New Testament than the 13 observed in Lesson 215 as discussed below. None. So let me just make sure that's clear. There were 20 notes that were marked. 13 of them were in the New Testament. Of the 20, 13 were in the New Testament. Scrivener, in this section, has more than that that he is including. Okay? Is everybody following that so far? 
None of the additional examples cited by Scrivener are explicitly marked by the 1611 as being textual in nature. They are marked with double vertical lines and simply read or, thereby indicating alternative English renderings. So they are not explicitly marked with one of those five forms on the previous page. Some read, some copies, some copies read, Greek copies, ancient copies. There are only 20 in the whole Bible that are marked that way, 13 in the New Testament. Scrivener has more that he's saying he thinks are textual in nature, but the, the additional ones that he is discussing in this section are not explicitly marked. Is everybody following that? Scrivener's claim that there are additional non-explicitly marked marginalia of a textual nature in the 1611 is retroactive and speculative. He is saying this more than 250 years after the 1611 was issued. So he is retroactively saying there are more than what the translator said of their own work. Is everybody following that? Okay. So I say that it's retroactive and speculative. Given the testimony of Samuel Ward at the Synod of Dort, which we already looked at in this lesson and that I emphasize ex explicitly as it relates to this point, Given the testimony of Samuel Ward at the Synod of Dort and the evidence furnished by the 1611 itself, the translator's words must take priority over Scrivener's. At the end of the day, there are only 20 marginal notes in the 1611 that explicitly catalog different readings found in the source text utilized by the King James translators. Okay? Now, the reason I'm stressing this point at the beginning of the analysis is because somebody's going to come along and they're going to say, well, you only gave 20, Scrivener gave 58, or Scrivener gave this many or that many in the New and the Old Testament, okay? And so your, your number is off. My point is Scrivener is retroactively identifying these in a speculative way after the, more than 250 years after the fact in ways that the translators did not choose to mark the text. Is everybody following that? Okay. And by the way, we should see so far, they did not hesitate to annotate the text in the margin. We know that because we've looked at 20 entire verses or partial verses for which they gave an entire alternative reading. So if they intended to mark something as a textual note, then they certainly would have done it. And there's evidence of them doing it 20 times. Is everybody following that, Bart? If the translators didn't identify the extra ones, how did he identify them? Going back to he went back through and retroactively compared them to other Greek editions and said, well, this one is a textual one too. Okay, And that's why I said it's retroactive and it's speculative. But in all those extra cases, the translators didn't choose to mark their work that way. So for him to do that is to retroactively speculate on what they did in ways that they didn't choose to demark it. You following that? Everybody following that? Okay. So, the following is a... Did I finish that point? Yeah. Okay. So, the following is a statistical breakdown of the different categories of... Uh, breakdown of the five different categories of marginal notes covered in Lesson 215. And again, I need to thank Alex Hanna for providing the data presented in the following table. Okay? Now, you guys can look at all the specifics on that. I just want to go to the end. Because um, it'll take some time to go through there. I just want to look at the end of this. So this is all five categories. There are seven verses in the Old Testament that are marked. That is 0.030% of the Old Testament. And there are 13 in the New Testament. There's a total of 20. And so the total on this, the total number of verses in the 1611 that for which there are potential variant readings marked in the 1611 is 0.064% of the canonical text. So again, that is a very, very small number of times that this is occurring, all right? So, first point under the table. The evidence presented in Lesson 215 and the table above suggests that the categories labeled Greek copies and many ancient copies are referring exclusively to variants stemming from known editions of the Textus Receptus. So, when they say Greek copies or ancient copies, and you look at the three times that those two different categories occur, they are specifically noting variants in Greek. Okay? Is everybody following that? Look at the next sentence. Put another way, 
These two categories are specifically noting variants in the Greek editions available to the King James translators. In contrast, the more general categories of some read, some copies, and some copies read are cataloging known variants in a, in a variety of sources utilized by the translators when doing their work, i.e., they are not exclusive to Hebrew and or Greek variants. They could be coming from any other place, okay? Therefore, these categories, and again, these that would be a reference to some read, some copies, and some copies read. Therefore, these categories could be referring to any of the following. They could be referring to prior English Bibles, Wycliffe, Tyndall, Coverdale, Matthews, Great, Geneva, Bishops, and Douay Reims. I showed you that last week when we went through the evidence, okay? Could be referring to the Peshitta translation. Could be referring to the Latin Vulgate. It could be referring to other Protestant era vernacular translations. The Spanish from 1569, the French from 1588, or the Italian from 1607. Could be referring to medieval, he medieval Hebrew manuscripts, Texas Receptus editions, and possibly the LXX or the Septuagint. Okay, so let me just, just summarize that. When it says Greek copies or ancient copies, it, when you look at those three occurrences, they are specifically dealing with variants in Greek. The other three categories, some read, some copies, some copies read, could be dealing with anything in a general sense, including Hebrew and or Greek, as well as any of the other evidence that I have in the list. Is everybody with that? Now, observations such as these should not be surprising when one considers the nature and scope of the translator's work outlined by Miles Smith in the preface. Remember that Smith said, quote, Neither did we think much to consult the translators or commentators, Chaldee, Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, or Latin, no, nor the Spanish, French, Italian, or Dutch, Neither did we disdain, neither did we disdain to revise that which we had done and to bring back to the anvil that which we had hammered and having and using as great helps as were needful and fearing no reproach for slowness nor coveting praise for expedition we have at length through the good hand of the Lord upon us brought to work, brought the work to pass that ye that you see. Okay? So does he acknowledge there that they looked at all of those things? Translators, commentators, Chaldee, Hebrew, Syrian, Greek, Latin, Spanish, French, Italian, or Deutsch. Dutch, German probably is the reference there. Okay, So they looked at all that stuff. So now when you're looking at the general categories of the 20 marginalia, some read, some copies, and some copies read, it's not shocking to see then that they could have been drawing from any number of sources in the noting of those variants. Is everybody following that? Okay. So, according to the data presented in the table above, only 0.064% of the canonical text of the 1611 contains marginalia noting textual variants in the sources consulted by the King James translators. Meanwhile, the NIV offers some 133 text-critical indicators in the text of the New Testament. According to Holgar Sesnat's article, some witnesses have the representation of the New Testament text in English Bible versions. He says, quote, the NIV offers some 133 text critical indicators in the text of the New Testament. Two of these come in the form of notes within the text itself and the rest by way of footnotes. So the NIV does this two different ways, within the text itself or in the footnotes. The format of these footnotes is fairly uniform with few exceptions. Variants are introduced as some manuscripts read slash add, example Matthew 5.22, or some manuscripts omit slash do not have, example Matthew 12.47. It must also be noted that the abbreviations MSS for manuscripts and MS for manuscript, which are sometimes used in the footnotes of the NIV, are never explained. This seems odd since these abbreviations are hardly common outside of the academic scene. Uh, later editions of the NIV seem to have um, converted all MSS designations to manuscripts. See also the current NIV website. Okay, Now, how many... Well, let's look at the next point. 
Quantitatively, that means in number, quantitatively a comparison between the text critical marginalia in the King James New Testament with that of the NIV yields the following results. Okay, now look at In the King James New Testament, the text critical indicators is only on how many verses? 13. Okay, 0.04% of the New Testament text. The NIV text critical indicators are 133, 1.671% of the text, for a total of 0.42%, 0.28%, a rate that is 10 times higher than the King James text. Is everybody following that? Okay. Just for clarity on the percentages, is that based on per verse or is it per word? No, it's based on per verse, per verse, not, I don't mean perverse as in like yeah, no, nasty. No, I mean based on the whole verse, not just each word in the Bible. Per slash verse, yes. Per per a verse. Yes. Per verse too. So there are 133 verses in the New Testament of the NIV that have text critical markings, compared to 13 verses in the uh, AV of 1611 that had text critical markings. Okay? So the number of text critical marginal notes in the NIV when compared to the 1611 is 10 times higher. Okay? Therefore, there is simply no quantitative comparison between the explicitly marked textual marginalia in the 1611 when compared to modern, verse, modern versions. So I know I'm only using the NIV as, a, as one example here, but if you look at the rest of the modern versions, it's going to be that the numbers will vary, of course, but they will be similar. Okay? So, quantitatively, in terms of number, are there far more text critical notes in a modern version than there were in the 1611? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, some will say, well, that's because they we know more tech, we have more textual data available to us now. So of course there's going to be, okay? So that's, that's how people who are modern version advocates are, might, might try to, you know, do away with this. So for now, I just want you to see that in terms of number, is there any comparison? In terms of percent of the text, do the modern versions have 10 times higher markings related to text critical notes? Okay. Now, let's move on to quantitatively. So qualitatively would be number. Quantitatively would be the nature of the difference. Okay. Quantitatively, when the nature of the marginal notes cataloging textual variants of the 1611 is compared with modern versions, there is simply no comparison between the two. The following table endeavors to break down 20, the 20 notes in question into qualitative categories based on the contents of each note. Okay? So go to the top, page 5. So I want to point a couple things out here about this table. I'm going to zoom out here just so I can get this whole thing on for the screen. And even that's not quite all of it. Okay? So notice, we have a category here of DW. DW means different way of saying the same thing. See that down there at the bottom? Yeah. Okay? Name is dealing with a pro the spelling of a proper name. SD is dealing with a substantive difference in meaning. Other is exactly that. It's just a, it's another category where it wasn't sure what to call it, okay? And omission is dealing with a text critical note dealing with the omission of a verse. And how many of those are there? One, okay? So, there of the 20, there are nine different ways of saying the same thing. That's 45% of, the no, of these 20 notes. There are five that are just different ways of spelling a proper name. That's a quarter of the text, another quarter of the, the notes in question. Substantive differences in meaning between the text and the margin is three or 15%, other is two for 10%, and omission is one for 5%, okay? So let's look at my analysis here of all of this. A quarter of the notes, five total, Ezra 233, 814, 1040, 1 Chronicles 1.6, and 1 Chronicles 1.7, 
deal with the spelling of proper names and are of no practical or theological consequence. So a full quarter of them, five total, are just dealing with the, how do you spell the name. Okay. Meanwhile, two notes are marked other, including the one found at 2 Peter 2.18, which is just strange on its face. Now, again, we went over that one last time, so if you weren't here, you're going to want to go back and look at it. I'm not going to spend time re-going over it now, just for the sake of time. Okay. But, meanwhile, two notes are marked other, including the one found at 2 Peter 2.18, which is just strange on its face and arguably the result of a scribal error or typo in certain printed editions of the Textus Receptus. There is a one, there is a difference of one Greek character accounting for the difference between the reading found in the text and the one appended to the margin. So we're talking about one letter in Greek. So that could have been the result of a copyist mistake or a typesetter of the Greek edition could have accidentally put the wrong character in. Is everybody following that? Okay. Likewise for the note at Luke 10.22. It marks a variant reading that is found in the AV in the text of the next verse at Luke 23. See explanation below. The remaining 13 marginal notes are analyzed further below. Now, does every, anybody have any questions? Okay, why don't you grab your Bible quick? I want to show you this one. <clears throat> Find just quick Luke ten twenty three. I know I said we discuss it below, but I just want to mention it now. Luke ten. Actually, Luke 10, 22 is where the note is at in the 1611. Okay, now notice Luke 10, 22. You see where it says, all things are delivered to me of my father. Does everybody see that phrase? <clears throat> okay, now drop down to verse 23. And he turned on his disciples and said, you see that phrase? There is a note in the 1611 at verse 22 about the first clause in verse 23 going at the beginning of verse 22 instead of at the beginning of verse 23. That is one of the ones that I have marked other. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what they have marked in verse 22 shows up in the text in verse 23 at the beginning of the verse with the phrase, and he turned unto his disciples and said, you with that? Okay, now if you don't believe me, you'll have to look back at the notes from last time. All right? Now, before we get into this analysis again, I want you to see that DW equals a different way of saying the same thing, and SD equals a substantive difference in meaning. Okay, so let's look at each one of these. The first one is Psalm 1023. Okay, so the first, the text says, like smoke. And the margin says, or as some read, into smoke. So I'm at the bottom of page 5. Okay, go to the top of page 6. To me, th this is a different way of saying the same thing. Being consumed like smoke or consumed into smoke are different ways of saying the same thing. So in other words, is there any substantive difference there between the text and the margin? No. no. Song of Solomon 5.4. Okay. For him in the text, or as some read, in me, in the margin. Different way of saying the same thing. Either way, her bowels were moved within her. This is a different way of saying the same thing. So go to Second Solomon. Second Solomon. Song of Solomon. Sorry. Can I find Song of Solomon? There it is. Song of Solomon 5 4. Okay. Second Solomon 5 4. Now notice. My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. Verses were moved in me. 
Either way are her bowels moved within her, whether they're in her or for him, the obvious outcome of the affection is towards who? Him. Okay? So, different way of saying the same thing. Matthew 1, 11. Let's go to Matthew chapter 1, 11. Matthew chapter 1, verse 11. So, the 1611, so I'm on this one right here, Matthew 1, 11. Josias begat um, Jeconias and his brethren. That's the text. Summary, Josias begat Jacob and Jacob begat Jeconias. So there's an extra name there. Okay? Now, look, so I say there, right here, I'm right here, guys, SD. Substantive, substantive difference. There is a substantive difference between the text and the margin in this case. Okay? If you go with the margin, are you adding an extra name? Yeah. Yes. The translators chose the theologically correct reading in the body of the text given the 14 generations mentioned in Matthew 1.17 while showing awareness of the variant in the margin. So look in your Bible, look at verse 11. Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren, right? So that is what the text had. Go now to verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away of the Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are what? 14 generations. So verse 17 has no textual dispute, and it says there's how many generations? 14. So now you go up a few verses to verse 11 and they encounter a variant and they go with the correct variant that adds up to how many total generations according to verse 17. 14, and then they note it in the margin. So, is there a substantive difference then between what's in the text and what they noted in the margin in this case? I would have to say the answer is what? Yes. Yes, okay. But they make the correct choice in the text to make, to make the math line up the way it needs to according to verse four, uh, verse 17. And there's no textual dispute in how verse 17 should read. Okay? Is everybody following that? 1 Corinthians 15, 31 is the next one. Let's go there. First Corinthians 15, 31. Okay? So let's look at the notes. The text of the 1611 says, your. The margin says, some read what? Our. So let's read the verse. Verse 31. Which when they had read, I'm not even in the right spot. Sorry about that. I'm so busy. Sorry, I'm just going to get the right spot. I was somewhere in Acts. <laughs> It's not going to work. Verse, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31. I protest your, I protest your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Okay? So the difference there is between your rejoicing and what? Um. Our rejoicing. Okay? Either way in the context... Both Paul and the Corinthians are what? Rejoicing. There's no theological or doctrinal impact here. At all. Okay? Different way of saying the same thing. Ephesians 6, 9. Let's go there. Ephesians 6, 9. Okay? Again, starting with the notes, just to keep the procedure the same. Ephesians 6, 9 your master also. That's what the text says in the 1611. The margin, some read, both your and their master. All right? So let's go look at it. Ephesians 6. And I actually want, uh, Ephesians 6, I actually want to back up to verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of heart unto Christ. So are servants supposed to obey their masters in the flesh? 
Yes. Now with thy service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Now watch. And ye masters, do the same thing unto them, forbidding, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons, right? So the text says, your master also, the margin of the 1611 said, both your and their master. So look at my statement right here. <clears throat> it is implied, <coughs> it is implied in the context that God in heaven would be the master of both masters and what? Okay. Servants, okay? The text and margin equal a different way of saying what? The same thing. It's obvious in the text that whoever the master of the masters is is also the master of who? The servants. The servants. Is that you guys following that? It's it's obvious in the context that that's the case. Look at First Peter chapter two, verse twenty one. First Peter chapter two. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Okay, so the text in the 1611 said, For us, the margin had some read for you. So let's look at it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For even where unto uh, were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Okay? So the question there is at for us versus for who? Christ also suffered for us. Well, did Christ suffer only for, did Christ suffer for both Peter and who Peter's writing to? Or did he only suffer for the people Peter's writing to? He suffered for both. Okay, so look at my note. Different way of saying the same thing. The context implies that Peter is including himself in the statement. The text and margin equal a different way of saying the same thing. Okay? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Okay? Now, Mike actually had some thoughts on this one for me. Notice... The, the text said against them and the margin said some read against themselves. So the difference is against them versus against who? Themselves. themselves. Okay. So let's look at that. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 11. The text reads, Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. So the them has to go up to somebody or something mentioned in the previous verse, right? So if you go to verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh and the lusts of uncleanness and despise government, uh, presumptuous are they, self-willed, uh, they are not afraid to speak evil, evil of who? Dignities. Dignities. Okay, so if it's them, it's either referring to, it's re, it, it seems that it would even, let's, let's just go to my note here, okay? So I'll, I'll mess it up if I don't read it, okay? I'm reading right here. <clears throat> the reading against them, found in the text, refers to either fleshly humans or dignities in verse 10. Okay. Whereas the reading themselves would be referring to the angels in verse 11. Okay. The question here to me of whether there would be a theological implication to this, I'm not sure. Um, I've thought about it. I've run some cross references and I, I, I just am not sure. Um, if there would be any theological significance to the difference here between the text and the margin, um, I, I'm not I'm not 
prepared at this point. I feel like I need to do more research on it. I'm not prepared to say one way or the other, okay? But I do note this, that the difference, if the difference between the text and the margin is substantive because it's impacting who the verse is referring to, who the them or themselves is referring to. Is it referring back to people in verse 10 or is it referring to the angels in verse 11? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. <clears throat> Verse 11 where it says, whereas angels, which are greater in power, you have to ask yourself, greater than who? The dignities in verse 10. Right. If it's the dignities in verse 10, uh, I think it is dignities being persons in authority, right? Right. That, that's what that Dignities is. would be he, he, persons in authority, yes. Bring not railing accusation against them which are the dignities right so i think you know, so probably refers to dignity. i think it probably refers to dignities too so if but i i am saying though that there would be a to me a substantive difference between who the who it's referring to between the text the text says them i don't have any reason to doubt them is the correct reading but they're noting a variant there that says themselves which would impact who it's referring to at the end of verse 11 is the point. Mm -hmm. Okay, Whether there's a theological implication to that, I'm still thinking through. Okay, Next one is Acts 25.6. Acts 25.6. So as you can see, we're not going to finish these notes. So that's good for me because it just means my next lesson is done. Theoretically. Acts 26. That's 25, excuse me, Acts 25, verse 6. So the text says, more than 10 days. The margin says, or as some copies read, no more than 8 or 10 days. Now, I don't think we need to read the verse here on this one, right? This would be a substantive difference, right? The variant, no more than 8 or 10 days, would be substantive, would compare it against the main body of the text, more than 10 days. More than 10 could be 11, it could be 12, it could be 20. Uh, maybe it's not 20, maybe it's not that many, but it's more than what? 10. No more than 8 or 10 means 8 minimum, 10 what? Maximum. Maximum. So there would be a substantive difference between the text and the margin here. Okay. So the variant no more than 8 or 10 days would be substantive when compared against the main body of the text more than 10 days. The difference, however, is of no theological slash doctrinal consequence. It's not impacting any issue related to theology or doctrine, regardless of how that reads. Again, I have no reason to doubt that the correct reading is the reading that's in the text. I think they believe that was the correct reading. That's why they put it where? In the text. James 2.18. Now, James 2.18 is more involved. I could probably do a whole lesson just on this, and I have talked about this in whole other videos. I added material to the notes for the last lesson at James 2.18. Okay? Now, let's go to James 2.18. I also addressed this in a video, one of my video responses to uh, Mark Ward and Timothy Berg. I addressed the uh, James 2.18 issue so I'm not going to delve deep into it here because I've covered it other places and I expanded the section in the notes from lesson 215. But look at the notes, top of page 7. Whoops. Top of page 7, the text says without and some copies read by thy works. Okay, so let's read the verse. James 2.18 Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So the difference there is between without and by. Okay? Now, I've, no I've noted this and marked this as a different way of saying the same thing, because the rhetorical force of the argument is the same either way. Whether it says by works or without works, it's the same either way. Um, and I went into great detail on this and I added a bunch of material related to this to the notes on Lesson 215. And I, again, I also addressed it in a prior video. So, the force of the argument is the same whether it reads by or without. 
the verse mean the, the it's a, the verse means the same thing regardless of how that specifically reads. And there are other editions of the TR and pre King James translations. Now I think that the translators resolved that issue based upon the most up to date information that they had. Bees is 1598 Greek, and they put without in the text, but they do note the variant in the margin. Okay, Second Peter two two. Here we have pernicious ways in the text versus or lascivious ways as some copies read. To me, this is a different way of saying the same thing. Pernicious ways versus lascivious ways are a different way of saying the same thing. I don't see any substantive difference in meaning between saying it pernicious ways versus lascivious ways. That brings us to 2 John 1.8. Okay, 2 John 1.8. The text says wrought. The margin says ordained. Some copies read, which ye have gained, but that ye receive. Okay, so there's two actually two issues here. So let's look at John, Second John, one. Second John one verse. Okay, eight. So look at it. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full what? Okay. So there's no dispute at the first clause. Look not yourselves that we lose not. So we, and that first we, is John including himself. Yes. Okay. Now let's look at the note. Okay. So there's two issues here. All right. First, there's the issue of wrought, wrought or gained. All right. So look at my note. There is no difference in the meaning in meaning between wrought and gained. Okay. As far as the pronoun difference between we and ye in the margin, ye in the margin, we in the text, as far as the pronoun difference, again, I think that's the same situation as what went on in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31, the, with the context made it clear that Paul, as the author, was including himself in the statement. I think the same thing is true here with John chapter 1, verse 8. Okay, so I think there's a different way of saying the same thing. Matthew 26, 26. Matthew 26, 26. So my dad listened to the last lesson. And he said to me, Boy, you're really in the weeds on this stuff. <laughs> uh, he's not wrong, probably, but like we're covering stuff that I've never seen covered anywhere, and it needs to be covered. Because this is all stuff now that is used by critics of the King James to try to leverage these notes and say, see, the King James did the same thing that modern versions are doing. Well, I've already showed you that quantitatively, that's not even remotely true. What we're looking at now is that, is that true qualitatively? You following where I'm going with this? Okay. So look at Matthew 26, 26. The text reads, blessed it. The margin states, many Greek copies have gave thanks. This is a different way of saying the same thing. The text blessed it, and the margin gave thanks equal a different way of saying the same thing. There's nothing here that is of any significance, in my opinion, on that variant. And then the last one here in this list is Luke 10.22. And this is the one I already showed you by we went to the verse, but Luke 10.22, all things. The margin says, and many ancient copies add these words, and turning to his disciples, he said. So let's just go, we're already there, right? You're in Matthew 26, 26. No, we're in Luke 10. Sorry, go to Luke 10. Luke 10, 22. Let me try to explain this as clearly as I can. Look at Luke 10, 22. Now, it says, all things are delivered unto me. In the 1611, there are two double vertical lines at the beginning of that verse. Where it says, you see it says all things, verse Luke 10, 22, all things. There's a note here, and then it go to the margin, it says many ancient copies add these words, and turning again to his disciples. So they're saying that there are, they've seen some copies that add that phrase, and turning again to his disciples, he said, they add it in verse 1. 
22. But now look at verse 23. And he turned to his disciples and said, So is the clause that they have marked in the margin at verse 22 as a, mar as a, as a variant reading in the text in verse 23? Yes. So some copies obviously put that clause in the wrong one, in the wrong place. Okay? So this is other. I mark this as other, right? The words found in the marginal reading at verse 22 are present in the text of the 1611 and verse 23. So again, it's, I, I didn't know what else to call it other than other. Okay? Luke 17.36. Luke 17.36 is the only marginal note in the 1611 dealing with the omission of an entire verse in earlier editions of the Texas Receptus, see Lesson 215. Okay? And this is Luke 17, 36. So find that. So look at verse... So the verse in question is verse 36. And two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. So if you look at the note... The note is, on the whole verse, two men shall be in the field and one shall be taken the other left. And then the margin says, this verse 36 is wanting in most of the Greek copies. But yet, did they put it in the, in the text? Mm -hmm. So they're saying that the verse, that in their estimation, should the verse be there? Yeah, because they put it there. And are they noting the fact that they've seen Greek copies that didn't have it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's just go up, though, a few verses. I tell you, in the night there shall be two men, one in bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, and one shall be taken, and the other left. And now here's the verse. Two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other what? Yeah. Left. All of that is three different ways of saying what? Same the same thing. He's just emphasizing it, right? The point that he's trying to make, all right? So, the verse should be there. They're noting in the margin that they've seen, they've seen certain texts that didn't have verse 36. So that is the only one where they're saying, we've seen evidence that, we've seen copies where this verse is what? missing okay so quantitatively most of the marginalia in the 1611 note variant readings in the source texts utilized by the King James translators let me start that over quantitatively most of the marginalia in the 1611 noted, noting variant readings in the source text utilized by the King James translators deal with the pro, deal, deal with the spelling of proper names and or constitute different ways of saying the same thing Okay, There are only three substantive differences in meaning between the text and the margin in the 1611. Matthew 1, 11, Acts 25, 6, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. None of which are theologically slash doctrinally consequential. Only one at Luke 17, 36 deals with the omission of a whole verse in earlier iterations of the TR. Okay? Is everybody with that so far? Mm -hmm. Yet. <clears throat> okay, so let's just stop here and just I want to make a point that's not in the notes. So here's what happens. Modern critical text, modern version advocates, they will go to these notes and they'll say, see, the King James translators were noting marginal notes. We're doing the same thing they did. Okay, I'm saying to you that is a major leveraging of what the translators actually did to support modern practice. They are not the same in number and they are not the same in type or form or content where, ver where tons of verses, our whole verses are questioned 
the authenticity of, of, of tons of verses, entire passages, uh, the woman taking an adultery, um, the long ending of Mark, where entire passages are questioned whether or not they should be, even be in the Bible at all. The King James Bible never does any of that, like is done in modern translations. So I think I have time to get this next quote, and then we'll probably have to stop. So, yet many contemporary advocates of the critical text slash modern versions, such as James White, I think that should say versions, plural, such as James R. White, seek to leverage the type of marginal notes covered in these lessons, that would be lessons 215 and 216, against King James Bible defenders. Consider the following example from the second edition of White's The King James Only Controversy, Can You Trust Modern Translations? He says, quote, Modern Bible translations as a matter of standard practice include footnotes to indicate to the reader where the Greek or Hebrew manuscripts contain variants. King James only advocates generally dislike such footnotes, feeling that they can confuse the reader that they are in, that they can confuse the reader that they are in fact faith destroying. If a version dares to note that a word, phrase or verse is questionable, it will be accused of attacking the word of God by those who define, that should say, uh, sorry, by those who define the King James Version as the word of God. Unfortunately, many, def many defenders seem unaware that as noted previously, the King James Version contained 8,422 such marginal readings and notes when first published. Now you need to stop there. What did he just imply? He just implied that all of these 8,422 marginal notes are just like the notes where? In modern. in modern versions. Now based upon our study here, is that even remotely true? No. It's not even remotely true. Yet he has no problem saying it or implying it. You guys following that? Okay. Most of these notes, gave, now, now notice how he... Notice what he says next. Most of these notes gave alternative readings, but some indicate that the King James translators recognize the existence of textual variants in the Greek and Hebrew text. Notice he says some. Does he tell you how many? No. Have I told you how many? No. Okay. One example would suffice. White shows, and this is my editorial comment, White shows no awareness of how many marginal notes fit this category. One example will suffice to demonstrate that the dislike of textual notes on the part of King James only advocates is more than slightly inconsistent. Note the King James own marginal reference to Luke 10.22, which is the last one of the last ones we just looked at. Many ancient copies add these words, and turning to his disciples, he said, If the King James is not attacking the word of God with such marginal notes, why is the New American Standard or the NIV? Now you see what he just did? First, did he equate all 8,400 marginal notes as textual? And he says, I'll just give you one example to suffice. And he says, he implies that all the rest of them are like the one here. You guys seeing that? Okay. White and his troop are seeking to equate notes like the one found in Luke 10.22 in the 1611 with the scores of text critical notes found in the critical text and modern versions as though they were the same thing. Note the suspect nature of White's argumentation. First, he mentions that the 1611 contained 8,422, quote, marginal readings and notes when first published. That said, only 20 of the AV's marginal notes appear to, arise, appear to raise textual issues, the vast majority of which are non-substantive. Then he cited one example, Luke 10, 22, without mentioning how many total notes fit this category as though it were emblematic of all the marginal notes found in the 1611 or found in the AV. The marginal notes in the AV dealing with textual variants when compared to the critical text and modern versions are far fewer in number quantitative and less significant in nature qualitative in that they are not calling into question the legitimacy of entire verses slash passages or changing the meaning of the text. You guys see the main issue here. Now, unfortunately, I'm in an awkward spot. Okay, If I go any further, I'm not going to have time to finish. 
So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here. Okay. So what have we seen in this lesson? We've gone through all of them. We've uh, all 20 of the ones that are specifically marked. We've discerned them using this table and uh, looking them up and looking at the, the, the nature of all of this. And we've seen how then uh, modern critical texts and modern version advocates want to leverage these footnotes against the King James and try to say that, well, the King James advocates are inconsistent because of the way they're, they're going about all of this. While, they, while James White makes no, shows no awareness at all of how many of these 8,422 notes are actually the category that he's talking about. Okay? Now, we, we're going to have to quit there. So, here's what's going to happen as far as I know right now. I'm going to cut the notes off at the bottom of page 8. I will take everything there and I will make a new lesson 217. I will, have a, I, will re, I will write a new introduction, and then we will continue with this analysis. Okay? Any questions? All right, well, thanks for your attention. We are done just a couple minutes early, and again, I'm doing that.